Well, good morning. It's good to be with you guys. As always, it's good to be back home again. We uh, spent most of the week in Louisville at the at the state fair. Uh, this was state fair week, and Michaela shows uh, sheep and, and cattle, and so we have things spread out in two different barns and had a neat experience to uh, uh, give you the, uh, uh, the grace uh, that was. And one of the things that I enjoyed going up there as many years as I've gone and, and been there, it's like a homecoming. There's so many friends and family from all over the state and that we run into that we only see uh, at the state fair or different shows and stuff. And uh, there was a family whose son used to show sheep and he... Uh, I uh, hadn't seen him. He graduated and aged out. I haven't seen the, the Pruitts in a long time. And uh, ran into him in Broadbent and, and when we were coming out of the cattle show. And if you've never really been around that, if it's kind of different for you. Uh, when kids show livestock, it's very strenuous. And it's also lots of... Uh, that their nerves get up, and, and so it's not uncommon for a kid to come out of the show ring and just be soaking wet and sweat, uh, because when they're holding that animal and trying to keep it keep it in, in check and make sure it doesn't get away from them, especially cattle ring, especially younger kids with cattle, they, they weigh a thousand pounds, and so you're trying to make sure that animal doesn't get away from you, and you're holding the chain, holding the head up, and so whenever Michaela comes out of the ring, she just hands them off, and it's like, I'm done here, take it, and, and I gotta go clean up a little bit and, and, and rest, and, and so when she comes out of the ring, I'm always standing at the edge of the ring, so when she comes out she just hands me the calf and and of course they know me and sometimes they're a little more afraid of me and sometimes it's not as <laughs> sometimes they don't like the handoff but anyway I've I've got Phyllis so we our, our two show heifers this year was Pam and Phyllis if you watch the office you'll understand so so Phyllis comes out to me and so I've got Phyllis and she weighs about a thousand pounds and, and she's a year old heifer and, and so I'm walking out of the barn with her and I've got her I've got her in my right hand and and I see the Pruitt standing there and so you know with me and I don't know if you guys have ever been you got kids and you're like walking in Walmart or walking somewhere and, and they get so close to you that they step on your heels and they you know they can step on you just get you so angry it's like you quit stepping on my heels and so I'm walking with this heifer and and I try to slow down and start looking over her back and talk to these people and she stepped on my right foot on my heel and took not only my shoe but my sock off okay so if you can imagine a calf a cow's hoof I mean she weighs a thousand and so she it was just perfect she just just skinned it right off my foot and I'm sitting there going Oh, a half more of an inch, and that would have just been all the skin on the bottom of my foot she would have taken off, but it didn't even hurt me at all. I was like, I'm standing there barefooted, though, with a calf going, somebody get me my shoe. And so we, we, we just love being up there, and that's one of the things that I'm very passionate about. I'm passionate about teaching kids, and I love watching kids learn. And I love watching kids grow, and, and I love watching them uh, do well. And, and it's one of those moments where you can have great success, you can have uh, you can have failure, uh, things can go wrong, uh, you can get stepped on, you can get kicked, uh, you know, you can get all kinds of things going on. Over the last uh, couple of weeks, we've been outlining a new a sermon series, and we're, we're plunging in pretty deep now. And today talks about the things that we're passionate about, the things that we enjoy, and, and the things that God has kind of wired into us that we love to do. And, and not everybody has the same heart. Okay, Last week we talked about S, and that was spiritual gifts. And today we're looking at heart. And, and, and when you realize what people's passions are, everybody has different passions. Uh, when people begin to talk to me about cows, it's like, he really is passionate about this, isn't he? I mean, this is really, I mean, you know, I start talking to you about pedigrees and doing all these things, and we're looking at bulls and cows and looking at cow families and heaven and herefords, and, and you're sitting there going, oh, you're just messed up, okay? Something's wrong with you. I don't even know what you're talking about anymore. And, and so, but, but there's things that God has wired into us that we are passionate about. And, and this morning, what I want, want to help you understand is that whatever that is, God wants to use it, all right? He wants to use it. Let's look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. It says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not humans, okay? Working for the Lord. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. We all love to do things, okay? We all have certain passions. We all have certain things about us that God has wired into us. But we have to understand that He really wants us to use that for Him. He wants us to use that for Him. And sometimes it's like, I really don't know how that works. See, God wants your heart to beat for Him. The ultimate contribution God has for you aligns with the passions that He's given you for His kingdom. When we identify our passions, when we identify... Our passions, that reveals uh, just another part 
of what God is creating that is the masterpiece of your life. Heart is where you're centered. Your heart is where you desire to serve. Heart is, is the altar upon the place that you, you, you use your talents. Okay, The gifts that we talked about last week, it, you, you take those gifts, and the giftedness is what you are, but heart is where you will most likely apply what you are. What is your heart? What is your heart? Evaluating your heart helps us determine where we might use those gifts. It helps us determine where we wish to serve and whom we wish to serve. Our heart also reflects our dreams and our desires. You see, we have passions, and as we have those passions, it's just those things that, that, that drive us. Okay, It's those things that, that drive us. And you know, when you, you see, Taylor doesn't have the same passion as Michaela does for the things that we do on the farm. It's different. When we came home uh, on, on Friday, uh, when we got home, uh, I was at school doing some things and we had to cook uh, for a tailgate party. And so I was getting the grill and everything ready. And, I, and she called me. We had new calves born this week. And I said, where are you? She said, I'm out in the pasture uh, checking on all the babies. And so, so she was driven to do that. Taylor would have never done that. If I had called her, he'd been like, where are you at? And you've been out? No. <laughs> it's just not really wired into her the way it is in Michaela. And so she would have done the same thing that I would do. And because we're, we're, we're very similar in our, in our natures. And, and, and so God wires into us these things. And, and, and so we ask the question. We're going to look at five questions this morning that helps us to discover our passion. And then in that the desire that God has given us and how he wants us to use that. Because you may think, well, you know, you, you talk about things that you're interested in, but I don't understand how that really equates to ministry. So we're going to get there. Number one, what drives you? you know, what is it that drives you? What, 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 it, what, what pushes you? What is, your, what is your desire? What is your passion? What is your heart? What, what is it that you would do if you could, you know, if you could just do something all the time? What, what is that? The key to discover the cravings that the Creator has put in you, sometimes they're deep within our spirit. We have to get alone and just get with God. We just have to get alone and get with Him and, and just really explore who we are and who it is that He has made us. Okay? Who, who, who are we and, and how has He wired us? How has He put us together? And we begin to listen for those whispers, those desires, those things that, 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 that we yearn for deep in our life. See, so the sad part is, is so many people, their passions go unexpressed it, particularly in the terms of serving that unique role that God has shaped them to do. We are so sadly settling for the mundane. We just settle for whatever it is. And, and we, we, we rarely become what God has called us to be and what He wants us to do. And for so many people, those passions that God has wired into them, they go unexpressed and most always uh, unexpressed in the terms of serving the Lord. So ask yourself these questions. What are your dreams? What do you, what do you drift toward? When you begin to, to see things, it's, it's that vision. When you begin to see your life in a, in a, in a, in a perspective that it could be whatever, whatever it could be, if there's just no limitations or what's, what does it begin to drift toward? And here's a good question. What do you really want to do for God? You ever thought about that? Have you ever just sat down and say, what do I really want to do for my Heavenly Father? If you're a Christ follower, if you, if, 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 if you realize, if you've come to that realization that He's paid the price for your sins, that he's, He has paid that penalty for you, and that you're going to spend eternal, eternity in heaven with Him, what do you really want to do for Him? I mean, what is, he, what is it? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about what is it that you really want to do for God, what motivates you to take that action? What is it that you crave? What is it that you crave? You see, I have a passion for teaching. I have a passion for teaching. I have a heart for learning and transferring that knowledge to other people. Most of my effectiveness happens outside of the classroom. Okay? Most of my effectiveness happens outside the classroom. Not all of my students have been able to in, in, uh, in, be involved in that. 
but I teach better away from the classroom than I do inside the four walls, okay? This is really not my thing, okay? When I'm hands-on, when I'm outside, when I'm in the shop, when I'm in the greenhouse, when I'm in the barn at State Fair, when I'm holding animals, and when I'm saying, hey, look at this, okay? When I'm teaching in, in, in an outside environment and I'm doing those kinds of things, that's where I'm most effective, and that's where my passion is. And if I could do that all the time, I would. I, I probably spent more hours teaching and more hours instructing and more hours helping and working this past week than I will this next week. Because it's not like work. <laughs> it was like being at a carnival. It really was. <laughs> okay, There were even rides in Ferris wheels that I didn't even ride. Okay, it, it, It's just what I, it's what I enjoy. A few years ago, um, we were on vacation on spring break. And uh, Troy was always, uh, uh, he was always cheap. Uh, still is. And when he was taking his kids, and he would look for, uh, he would look for discounts for pastors. And so he found this uh, place in Colorado uh, called Christ Haven Lodge and I'm coming back from Florida and he's driving back from Colorado I think in a snowstorm because he went out there in April because uh, he's cheap and so he's calling me and, and he's like hey you, you won't believe this place and so we start talking and he's like we should go we should go out there and I said well and and, and so he began to, to talk with them and see what they would need and I said well let's just do a mission trip I said if they're trying to get this thing started and so we got acquainted with this couple and, and began to learn who they were and uh, their name was Randy and Kesty Suggs, and they, they had uh, sold everything they had and everything they owned in Virginia. He was a very successful real estate agent. He had sold everything that he had, and they had bought this uh, lodge. In the, the, it was on the, the western slope of Pikes Peak. And their dream was to have a Christ-centered uh, uh, retreat center. But when I got out there, and, and we did some work on, on the thing and had a really neat mission trip, but when I spent some time with Kesty, uh, just talking to both of them about what their vision was for their, uh, their lodge and what their vision was, what, we, we kind of connected on, on the animal uh, side because she loved horses. Okay, and I'm, I'm scared to death of horses. I love cows, but horses terrify me. If you've never been around me, you know that because they always throw me. And so I like to hold the handle and I like to pull a brake rather than holler, whoa. So anyway, I, I, I'm scared of horses, but she loves horses. If you're around anybody that has a passion for horses, she loves it. But she just didn't want to go to Colorado and just have a ranch and just ride horses. She also had a passion for special needs kids. Okay, and you know, we here in, in this area we have dream riders, and we have these. And her vision, her goal was to be able to have camps to bring special needs kids out and use horses to minister to them and to work. This was her path. And when she began to tell me this, her eyes would light up, and she would just become passionate, and she would begin telling me what her dream was. And, and so now they do this, and so now they're able to do that. And we were able to just have a little tiny part in getting their facility a little bit better down the road, so that they could be able to fulfill that dream. And so that was that moment when they said, look, if I could do anything that I could, if I could just be anywhere or do wherever, and do, this is what I would do, I would do this. And then God began to allow that to become a reality because it was her passion. You think, well, how in the world? But see, that's what she could do. God took her passion, her heart for loving horses and loved a horseback ride and gave her a ministry to, to these kids that she also had a passion for. She had a passion for serving these children and a passion for reaching out to them and a passion for connecting them. Second question for this morning, who do you care about? Who do you care about? Better question, what breaks your heart? What breaks your heart? I did a sermon series on this once. What breaks your heart? If you've studied Christian uh, history at all, you've heard of a man by the name of D.L. Moody, Dwight L. Moody. Dwight Moody was one of the great evangelists of our time and uh, a few years back. He was a 19th century preacher and, and uh, he had uh, some incredible, uh, an incredible ministry and, 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 and incredible evangelistic tours. And, and in one of his tours in London, there were several other pastors in the area that began to ask the question, what is it that drives D.L. Moody? Why is he so successful in reaching the lost? What, what is it about him? What is it about him that when he comes to town, people come to the altar? They had a, it was a, it's a legitimate question. What is it about D.L. Moody that makes him tick? And so they went to his room, and they, they had meetings with him, and they asked him the question, what is your secret? What is it that you do that we do not? I mean, we love the Lord. We, we want to see lost souls saved. We want to... We want to see this happen, but when you come to town, something 
happens. So what is it? He got up out of his chair. He walked over to the window. And he opened the curtain. Below the hotel where he was staying was a, was a, was a park filled with people. And D.L. Moody asked each man that was there, each pastor that was there, he said, walk over to this window and look out the window into this park and describe for me what you see. And the, and the pastors begin to go to the window and they begin to describe the people that they saw. Here's a person, there's a person, here's a person that is standing, this person is wearing a hat, this person is wearing a coat, and they begin looking and they begin describing to him what they saw in the park below. And as he stood there and listened to them, as he stood there and listened to them to describe, as he listened to that, tears began to flow down his face. And finally, one of the pastors said, we're missing the point here. Pastor Moody, what do you see? And with tears in his eyes, he said, I see thousands of lost souls that if they don't find Jesus are doomed to an eternity in hell. That's what I see. And it was like, oh, you have a passion. You have something wired inside of you that you just can't even look at a crowd and not just see people. You look and see lost souls everywhere you go. Every time you check, God has wired into you an evangelistic passion that is unmatched. And, and you can't escape that. And so he wired him to be an evangelist. Now, listen. <laughs> Coming up in a month, on the first Monday night of October, in our amphitheater, out behind Living Faith, we have someone coming. His name is Pastor Steve Ayers. And Steve is the pastor of Hillview Heights Church. And I have known and watched Steve's work and watched his, his pastor his pastor at that church for 20-plus uh, years. It's a different kind of a place, all right? Listen to me. Hillview has led the state of Kentucky in baptisms for over 20 years. Over 500 people are baptized a year in that church. And why is that? Because God has wired his heart that way. All right, he's a different cat, all right? He is a different duck, and he is wired that way. He, he, it's in his, he has such a passion, all right? He doesn't see, he, he has one question for you when he meets you. Have you been saved and baptized, all right? Answer quickly, okay? Because if you don't, you're going to get wet, okay? Because he wants to know. It's his, it's his passion. It's his heart. And listen, he is coming to share in a joint event here. Uh, it, it's a Man Up Monday wow event together. Because here's the deal that I want you to know. You may not be wired like Steve. You may not be wired like D.L. Moody. But God has given you someone in your life that he wants you to help reach. All right? And you're, you're, you, you may not be the one who preaches the message, okay? You may not be the one who, who leads them to Christ, but you are the one who befriends them. You are the one who develops a relationship with them, and you are the one that says, I got some place that I would like for you to come, all right? I have some place that I want you to go. I have someone that I want you to hear, all right? And, and that is how God uses that. Listen, that is a question. As, as we look at this and as we look at what, what, what your passion is about and all those things, God has placed people in your life who He wants you to help Him reach. Who is that for you? Who is that for you? Who is God nudging you to help? Who is He nudging you to help? You may be drawn to people who are apathetic. You may be drawn to people who are facing marital conflict. or you, It just may be somebody who simply needs Jesus in their life. And we meet them all the time, don't we? <laughs> okay. Sometimes we walk away from an encounter and think, that person needs Jesus. Okay. They really need Jesus. Okay. And some of those people, God has just placed in your life. It's not just somebody that you have a, an encounter with and it's like, oh, they need Jesus. It's somebody that you live with, you work with every day. And it's like, this person really needs Jesus. Okay, then maybe you're the one to introduce them. Maybe you're the one who, to introduce them. And maybe all that is is just, won't you come with me Monday? Okay, won't you come with me to this event? We want you to come. I want you to be there. Think about that. And think about that as that time approaches. That's not the only opportunity, but it's a great opportunity. And we need to take full advantage of it. 
Maybe you're driven to make an impact on a specific group or a specific demographic, or maybe it's in the business world. Maybe it's, it's children. Maybe it's, maybe it's youth, whatever it is. Ask yourself this question. Who do I feel I can most profoundly influence for God? Who do I feel I can most profoundly influence for God? Where do I feel led to minister? What, what, what group do I feel led to serve? And how can I impact them in a way that will maximize the gifts that God has given to me? Third question. What needs will you meet? What needs will you meet? You know, there are so many people that have so many needs. Um, you know, that's one of the things that, that is wired into our DNA here at Living Faith. It's part of our vision. It's part of our mission to meet human needs in the name of Christ. It's right there. If you read it, you'll find it. To meet human needs in the name of Christ. What needs are you specifically equipped? What do you have a passion to meet? Okay? We have a tremendous ministry at the food pantry. Every Wednesday night we meet human needs. We, we provide food for folks. I mean, come on, listen. The, the United States is the most gifted agriculture nation on earth. We, we feed ourselves and, 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 and half the world, okay? I mean, it's really crazy the amount of agricultural production that we can crank out. The, abil the ability that we have to grow and raise and produce food is unbelievable. It's unmatched to any nation on earth, and we're just actually idling, okay? I mean, we, we, can, the, we can ramp up production in ways that you can't even imagine. I can blow your mind with the things that we are capable of doing that we haven't even tapped. But in the midst of all that amazing production and ability and skill that we have to produce food, we have people that are hungry. We have children who go home to their houses and don't have food. Come on, listen. We, we, we give backpacks away in our schools. We were able to do that this summer. Okay, part of the program from the food pan. We were able to provide backpacks. We were able to provide food to children who do not have access to food. What needs will you meet? What needs will you meet? What drives you? Okay, what, what drives you? What, what, what impacts your life? What has God wired you to do? Maybe there's a painful experience in your past. Okay? Come on, I know this. All right? I've, I've lived through some things. God's been pretty good to me. Well, I've been really blessed. And some of you guys have been through some rough things. Some of you have been through divorce. All right? I get that. Maybe God's calling you to help somebody else. Every time I see a post, every time I see a post about somebody who's gone through a miscarriage, I try to reach out to them. Because 25 years ago on Labor Day weekend, Sandy and I went through that. All right? We survived it. We went through it. God blessed us with two beautiful girls, and it doesn't always happen that way. But I always reach out and say, look, I, I, I get it. I understand. I know where you're coming from. I know the pain you're feeling. What experience have you been? You know, some of you have lost loved ones, people that are very close to you. And, 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 you're, and, you're, and it's, it's tough. Okay? And God says, look, I want to use that. I want to use the hardest part. I want to use the most difficult thing that you've endured, the hardest thing that you've gone through. I want to use that to help you connect with other people. Because here's the thing you need to know. You ain't alone. Okay? You ain't alone. There's other folks going through the same thing you are. And it's when we bind together, it's when we, we connect together, and when we, when we link together that God helps us. He helps us get through it, and then He helps us help other people. Who better to help people overcome difficulties and grow with Christ than somebody who has been through the same trouble and has moved, been able to move on? The next question, what cause will you help conquer? What cause will you help conquer? Yeah, I don't know what drives you. I don't know where it's going to start for you. But, but this, is, this is the thing. Uh, Millard Fuller uh, left behind a, a, uh, lots of business achievements, but uh, many things that he did. But one thing that, 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 see, that was planted in his heart was building homes for families with little or no income. Okay, Now think about that as a dream. Think about that. It's like, okay, dude, your passion, I mean, you're, you're a builder, you're a contractor, and your passion is to build homes for people who don't have a home. It's a pretty tall deal, isn't it? All right? I mean, so, some of us have a, have a hard time paying for the one we're living in now. How are we going to pay for one that for, the, for somebody who doesn't have one? That's a pretty, pretty big deal. And you think, well, there's no way I can do that. I, I can't even do one. Well, he established a ministry that all of you know today is Habitat for Humanity. Okay? He established, because, because here's the thing, by ourselves we can't. 
But together we can. Together we can. Andy Stanley has a, has a phrase that uh, is so powerful, I, I used this to do a sermon uh, series one time, and, and, and it applies here very, very good, and, it, and, it, and it's this. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Okay, because, because the overwhelming sense of that I can't do for everyone causes us to be paralyzed sometimes. Okay, and it's just like, well, I can't do, I can't feed all those kids. I can't provide a house for everybody who doesn't have one. Okay, let's stop. Listen, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. And you think, well, how do I pick? That's not fair. Life's not fair. Okay, mama's not fair. Daddy's not fair. Life's not fair. God doesn't try. He's not calling you to save the whole world, but he is calling you to, to minister to one. He's calling you to, to, to help one. So do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. And you never know how God will bring together others alongside of you to minister to more. There's so many things. There's so many causes that could be championed for God's glory. I don't know what drives you. I don't know what drives you. Maybe, maybe it's abortion. Maybe when you see that, maybe, maybe some of you have experienced that. Some of, we have people in our community that, has, that have survived that. Okay? I don't know what it is. I don't know what drives you. I, we uh, had at Ridgecrest. We had uh, like three ladies that were uh, that couldn't hear. They were deaf, and so there was a ministry there to, to minister to those. And, and, and we had uh, this lady who was so passionate about that. It was what she wanted to do was minister to them. I, I don't know what your passion is. I, I don't know what drives you. I don't know what God has wired into you when you when you see something. If it's children who are at risk, if it's if it if it's alcoholism, if it's if it's uh, domestic abuse, whatever it is, who will you reach? What what cause will you champion? What will be your driving place? What what is it that, that God has wired into you that has given you passion to to help make a difference, to help make an impact? I always find kids um, that just light up when they're around animals. There's just certain kids that just cling to that. And, and, and so many times that unlocks a whole pattern of things that have gone on or whatever. But, but some kids just you know, have a great home and they just love animals. But, 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 but that gives us an, an avenue. It gives us an opportunity to be able to connect and a place to be able to teach. Whatever it is. Okay, whatever your passion is. Uh, the final question uh, as we look at this is, what dream will you fulfill? Okay, what dream will you fulfill? John Eldridge uh, wrote a book. It's a powerful book called Wild at Heart. If you've never read it, you should. And, 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 and some, of, some of, uh, of what he writes helps us that our goal here is to recover the adventure that God has written on our heart when he made us. He wired these things into us. And, and, and so many times we allow the world, we allow things to kind of press that back down, and we don't become completely what God has called us to become. Your deepest desires reveal your deepest calling. And, and God wants to tap into that, the, the adventure that he has for you. You have to decide not what you'll exchange a, a life of, 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 of control born out of fear for a life of risk born out of faith. You see, because here's the thing. <laughs> here's a question. If you had permission to do what you really want to do, what would you do? What would that be? Because when I ask you, what would you really want to do? And you would say, well, if it weren't for, or if I had the, or if I had plenty of, well, forget the if. What would you do? What would you do? If you could do anything that, that you feel passionate about doing, what is that? If you had permission to do anything that you really want to do, what would you do? What is the greatest desire of your heart? And here's the thing. Don't ever ask yourself how when you're exploring what God's heart is for you. Don't ask the question how. That's God's question. Okay? All right? When God called you guys to establish a dental clinic in Haiti, you didn't ask how, did you? Because when you ask how, it's like, well, we can't do that. We're not a dentist. Okay? We don't even have the equipment. But God called you to do that. And when he called you to do that, then he provided, see. He provided. Things begin to happen. Dentists begin to call and say, hey, I'm retiring. Won't you come and pick up my whole clinic and move it to Haiti? Those things happen. Why? Because God was talking to the dentist, because he does that. 
Okay? He does those things. You see, don't ask how. When we begin to say, well, I would, but well, okay, forget that. Okay? Don't ask how. Ask what. What is God calling us to do? Don't ask yourself how. How is never the right question because how is a faithless question. How is a faithless question. That's God's department. That's what He does. He's asking us, what? What would you do? What have I wired you to do? What have I designed you to do? What have I, what have I called you to do? If you could do what you've always wanted to do, what would it be? You see, dreams get buried by jobs sometimes that are unfulfilling. We do things just for money. And, and I've seen this happen so many times. I, I've seen this happen in the school system a lot. I've seen it happen in the school system where somebody is so passionate about doing what they do, but they do something else because they want more money. And then you look at them and it's like, you're not happy, are you? No. Why are you doing it? Why are you doing that? We, we do things for, for the wrong reason so many times expecting God to bless it, and He won't. <laughs> okay? When you do something for the wrong reason and expect God to bless it, He won't. He just won't do that. And so we get buried sometimes by jobs that are unfulfilling, situations that are unraveling, to-do lists that are unending, and then finances become overwhelming. And then we just get stifled because of all the stuff. And there we go. One warning, though, as we begin to close, is that not every dream that dances in your heart reflects God's will for you. Okay? Let's look at Romans chapter 7 and verses 15. Uh, where it says, I do not understand. This is Paul saying, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And this is what he's revealing in verse 16. And, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. But then I realize that as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin that is living in me. So be careful of that. Be careful of that. Not everything that we desire, not everything that is within us is good. Sometimes a desire for personal comfort, sometimes a desire for success, sometimes a desire for glory displaces a passion for God's glory. And, and then victory over our selfish desire comes only when the Spirit guides our life. Look at, look at Romans 8, 2, because then, then we flip this around. In, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 2, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free. Okay? has set you free from the law of sin and death. And so here's the thing. <laughs> what pursuit would release the passion in my life for God? You see, what, what, what is it? What is He calling you to do? What, what, is it, what has He wired you to do? What is it that you're passionate about? What God-centered dreams can you identify that have been buried by the yuckiness and the messiness and, and, and the stickiness of life? What is it that he's called you to do? What has he wired you to do? What passion has he given you? What would I attempt to do for God with the rest of my life? What are you going to do with the rest of your life? You know, you're, you're as only as, as old as you feel, okay? I mean, when God's given you life and given you breath, okay, then you can just go. You can just go. And sometimes I apparently am learning that I feel younger than I look. I don't know how this is working, but I, I, I pull into the State Fair Wednesday, and, and Sandy's riding with me, and, and I have two of our exhibitor tickets, and I hand them to the nice lady at the gate, and she hands me one back, and she said, I just need this one for parking, sir, because today is Senior Citizens Day at the fair. You guys have a great day, okay? And I'm thinking, I'm looking over at Sandy and thinking, I'm not going there. <laughs> leaving that alone uh, and you know it's like okay what do I how old do I look okay how old do I look uh, Andy Stanley tweeted this past week he was uh, it was 30 years of marriage his wife is named Sandy too and he said she looks 30 and I look happy <laughs> and, and so I'm happy and I feel young but apparently I'm looking older than I am but but here's the thing you're only as old as you feel and if God has you here and he has wired you and he's given you a passion just do it okay just get out there and do it. Pursue it. Live that dream. And, and, and do what God has wired for you. Because, see, he, he, he wants you to make an impact in the world. He wants you to make a difference. You know, when I, when I go in, uh, we, were, we were at State Fair, and Mr. Dalton, they said, was there uh, registering exhibits. And he looked at, at, one of the, uh, at one of the other act teachers, and he said, this is my 52nd year of doing this. He said, don't you think it's time to quit? 
And they said, no, not as long as you're still passionate about it. Not as long as you still enjoy it. Not as long as you want to come out here and connect with these kids and connect with these folks. No, it's, you're not, you don't have to quit. No. God has given you life. He's given you health. He's given you ability. And He has given you a passion and a heart to do something for Him. And don't let age and don't let whatever it is hold you back from that. You see, passions make work seem like play. All right? Passions make work seem like play. You know, this year I started with the greenhouse, and, and, and I absolutely loved it. I sat down with one of my mentor's widows back in June, Miss Pat. Miss Pat and Harold Wood were married uh, for uh, over 50 years, and Harold was a pastor and an ag teacher for 42 years. He worked for 42 years doing both together. And I, and I asked her, I said, uh, how long did Harold teach? And she said, well, he started out as an extension agent in Fayette County in Lexington before he started teaching, and then he taught for 42 years. And I was like, holy cow. And then she looked at me, and she said, you know, he probably went a little too long. Uh, he had a stroke uh, while he was at the North American Livestock Expo with a bunch of kids, and, and, and he was up in his 60s when he, when he was there, and, and, and he looked older than he was because he worked so hard, and, 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 and Harold had a stroke while he was there, and she looked at me, and she said, we probably stayed a little too long. She said, but you know why we did? And I said, why? And she said, well, in his last 10 years of teaching, he built a greenhouse at the school at, at Lone Oak in, uh, uh, in, in McCracken County. And she said, and Greg, he loved it. She said he had such a passion for that. And she said he just did not ever want to leave it. She said he, he would go to work early and he would stay late. And she said I would, the kids were grown. And she said I would go there with him. And we would just work with the flowers. And she said, we just loved it. And I said, you know what? You didn't stay too long. You did what God called you to do in both places. You know, and it's not just loving that, but she, he loved his kids. He loved his students. And he had a passion for developing them and working with them. And that was who he was. It was who he was. What are your dreams? What do you naturally excel at? Because passions make work seem like play. And, and our gifts and our passions together make rocket fuel. Okay, When you put your gifts and your passions together, it ignites. And it propels us to a place of service. That when we mix those, what we're going to talk about next week is our natural abilities. When we put those things together, then God can really, he can really get things done through you. What is it that you're good at? What is it that you excel at? What is the passion of your heart? You see, this is the way you discover that. You have to let God speak to you. You have to let Him speak to your heart. What are your passions? If you could do anything, what would it be? Think about that question. And then ask God, how can it be? How can it be? If I could do anything, if there was no limitations, then what would that be? And then ask God, what? What will I do? You see, it's God's, it's God's question as to how. It's not you. You just leave that with Him. You just leave that with Him. But you need to know your heart. You need to know your passion. Let me pray for you. Father, we come before you this morning thanking you uh, that you have wired into us a passion. Uh, that you have wired into us a skill. You've wired into us a, a desire. You've just given us a heart for certain things. And Father, as we seek to discover that, as we seek to, to learn that, as we seek to unlock that potential, Father, I just, I pray, Father, that in this moment, that we can just be alone with you. That we can just hear you. Father, so many times we allow the busyness and the yuckiness of life to just suppress our heart. And Father, you, you have people that you want us to reach. You have places that you want us to go. You have things that you want us to do. And you've wired us for that. And so, Father, help us to discover what that is. Help us to know how that, how that works. Father, help us to not get hung up. In